Today, I'm delighted to uh, introduce Edward Farley Aldrich, Ted Aldrich. And he has written his first book um, in the, going back to World War II. It's called The Partnership, George Marshall and Henry Stimson and the Extraordinary Collaboration that won World War II. Now, I'm gonna let him tell the story. Um, but Ted, uh, way back in the second grade in an elementary school in Rowayton, he walked in in the classroom and he saw all the presidents on the wall and he was smitten. The earth moved. And he, he just fell in love with history. Um, he was sane enough not to pursue an academic career. Uh, he went to Colgate and he got a degree in economics, political science. And then he went on to get an MBA in finance from Boston College. And he's had a, a very distinguished career uh, in finances, particularly uh, commodities, specializing in special metals, uh, special metals. But his passion has been history. And he says that, you know, on those commutes from Connecticut to New York, uh, he was reading voraciously and even wrote some of his book on the train. He has a library of 700 plus history books, and he is a, a real devotee. And he's written this kind of uh, really well-researched book on a uh, corner of World War II history that really ne needs to uh, have more light. So without further ado, uh, let us give a warm welcome to Ted Aldrich. Ted. Thank you, Hollister. Uh, but I wanted to correct him. Uh, I did try to pursue an academic career, and I went to the Dean of History my freshman year, uh, and I said, I want to pursue an academic career in history. And he said, why would you want to do that? <laughs> and he proceeded to tell me that his life story that he's, you know, he said, what's going to happen is you're going to, uh, first of all, you make no money, and you're forced to publish, and students fall asleep in your class, and then you're gonna fall in love with someone in the academic world, and God forbid if you get a job at the same school, so you're gonna be working at Duke, and she's gonna be working at Middlebury, and you'll start to see each other once a week, and then it's gonna be once a month, and then he went on and on, and he said, do you love history? And I said, yes. Then he said, just read it on your own time. So uh, uh, that's the first correction, and the second is, um, I have had a full job. I still have a full-time job. Uh, Hollister mentioned I wrote some of the book on the train. I wrote all the book on the train. And uh, uh, it, it's helped because Connecticut infrastructure is pretty bad these days. So the ride to and from Westport to New York used to be an hour. Now it's like an hour and 15 minutes. So for me, I had an extra half hour a day to, to write. Uh, um, but anyways, thank you all for allowing me to speak today. Um, I'm gonna start with a story. Uh, and that is, it was late November 1943, and the war had been, Pearl Harbor had happened two years earlier, so U.S. had been involved in the war for two years, and Franklin Roosevelt had a big decision to make, and that was who was going to lead D-Day. Uh, he had been struggling with this decision for several months, but because D-Day was six months away, uh, June of 44, he had to make a decision. And he had two choices. Uh, the logical one was the man on the left up there, George Marshall. Uh, he was the most respected military man in the country. He was head of the Army and Air Force, because the Air Force was not independent at that time. He had built the Army up from scratch. He was made its head four years earlier. Uh, he was commanded the respect of Congress, the British wanted him to run D-Day. Uh, he, he was the, the logical choice. The other was, of course, Dwight Eisenhower, who, when Marshall was named head of the army, he was just a lieutenant colonel in the Philippines. Marshall had plucked him out, promoted him several times, and he was now running uh, the Army and Air Force in, uh, in Europe. Um, so those are, the two, the, the, those are the two candidates he had. And he was heading for the Tehran Conference, where he was going to meet Churchill and Stalin. Uh, 
And it seemed he had decided in favor of Marshall. And he stopped in Algeria to see Eisenhower to probably let him off the hook easily or, or uh, tell him in person that he wasn't going to name him. So he, sees, he manages to get Eisenhower alone, and he says the following. He says, and sometimes I have a Roosevelt imitation when I do this, and so maybe I'll give it a shot here. He said, Eisenhower? <laughs> he, said, uh, he said, I'm not going to do it. He said, you and I both know who the chief of staff was during the American Civil War, but nobody else does. And I don't want George Marshall, 50 years from now, to be a minor footnote in military history. Eisenhower shook his head. He probably understood. I don't think he had that much expectations to, to be the commander of D-Day. That was the end of that meeting. Roosevelt went on to the Turan Conference, obviously still indecisive. And the reason he was indecisive is he, because he felt Marshall deserved it, but he also knew Marshall was indispensable in the job he was at in Washington. And many people told him that. The Secretary of Navy, the head of the Navy, the head of the Air Force, Hap Arnold, General Black Jack Pershing of World War I fame, they all at one point went to Roosevelt and said, don't even think about sending Marshall to Europe because everything's going to fall apart if you do. He is in control of the whole show in Asia and in, in, in Europe and with all the various constituents that, that are part of the war. But Roosevelt must have been a nice guy because he really did want, he thought Marshall deserved it. So he sent his aide, Harry Hopkins, to, um, to talk to him, to flush it out with Marshall. And Hopkins approached Marshall and said, hey, regarding this D-Day thing. Do you wanna, who do you think should command it? And Marshall said the same thing he always said. He was a man of the highest integrity in the army uh, and he was known for that. He just said, president has to make the decision that's in the best interest of the country. I'm not gonna bias it with how, how I feel. So Hopkins went back to Roosevelt and said, and Roosevelt said, you know, what did he say? He said, same thing he always says. So Roosevelt decided one last time he was gonna go see him himself and he said, General, I need your advice. Who should command the troops at, at D-Day? Do, do you want the job? You know, I'm going to let you decide who has the job. And Marshall said to him, even though Marshall definitely wanted to be the head of D-Day, the commander, every army person wants to be in command, Marshall said, uh, Mr. President, you have to make that decision yourself. And Roosevelt threw up his hands and said, well, I would not sleep if you were out of Washington and he named Eisenhower to be commander. Of course, the rest is history. Eisenhower went on to become president, and there's memorials built about him. And Marshall, if it weren't for the Marshall Plan after the war, Roosevelt would have been right. He would have been thought of the same as Henry Halleck, who was chief of staff during the Civil War, and Peyton March, who was chief of staff during World War I. Uh, I think the world, but certainly Americans, we tend to raise up the guys on the white horse with the sword, not the people who have a desk job out of harm's way. So it's one of the reasons uh, I wrote the book, and it kind of leads me to, uh, to describe quickly how I break this presentation up, which is why I wrote the book, uh, and also what was so special about Stimson and Marshall. Um, as Hollister mentioned, read a lot of history, and during, I tend to jump around from era to era, and often, much like our generation, and that includes all of you, World War II is pretty compelling. And at some point, I read about all these guys who are surrounding Stimson and Marshall. You have Roosevelt, whoop, sorry. You have Roosevelt, and Eisenhower, and Churchill, and Patton, and MacArthur, and Omar Bradley, Curtis LeMay, the Air Force General, Charles de Gaulle, head of France, Oppenheimer, the one who built the bomb, and Bernard Montgomery, who is a, a field marshal in the British Army. And publishers like to publish books about these guys, and we like to read them. And, but during the course of reading it, I was always coming across Marshall and Stimson's name, and uh, never together, but I just thought, wow, I, I should read about these guys. So I read a book about Marshall, completely impressed. His career was, was amazing. And um, 
it, at that point, I didn't have a book in my future. Uh, I probably went back into the Civil War or some other part of history. Um, but later on, I got into a Cold War phase, uh, the post-war, and I started reading about guys like John McCloy, Robert Lovett, uh, Jim Forrestal, Avril Harriman, Dean Acheson, Eisenhower, McGeorge Bundy, the National Security Advisor under Kennedy, and George Bush Sr., the president. All these guys were involved at some point from the Cold War, which was from 45 to 91. And there, Stimson's name kept on popping up. He was either a mentor to these guys, particularly the two on the left served under, under the war, or these others just followed, followed his policies and worshipped him as this wise man. So at that point, I became intrigued with the relationship. Um, wanted to learn more about it. Read a ridiculously long book on Marshall. Got a little more information about the Marshall-Stimson relationship. But then I found the Stimson Diaries at Yale. And 10,000 pages, 4,000 of which he kept during World War II, I wouldn't have been able to write the book on a train without the Stimson Diaries. Although they were in microfilm, I managed to get them converted to digital, and it was a fascinating account that many historians use for World War II. He wrote four or five pages every day about who he met, what he talked about, how he felt, and I had only read a few pages on microfilm at Yale, and I realized, this is it. If I can get a hold of these diaries in digital form, I can write this book, which I did and I started writing. So quickly, one of the things that uh, was so intriguing to me was how these guys worked so well together, but they came from completely different backgrounds. Stimson, and as I'm in Greenwich, Connecticut, this isn't gonna overwhelm you as, as much as other places, uh, but he went to, oops, sorry again. He went to, um, Phillips of Andover, he went to Yale, number three in his class. Harvard Law, number two. Worked for the, one of the most prestigious law firms in New York, Root and Clark. Uh, then he became US attorney to the Southern District of New York. Uh, then he was Secretary of War in 1911. Now think about that. 1911, we were still fighting Native Americans. Uh, we had one airplane in the entire military service. And later on, he was Secretary of War here in 1940, and he introduced us to the nuclear age. Stimson was responsible for building the bomb. Um, it's a remarkable, lengthy career. He served in World War I when he was 50 years old as an artilleryman on the front lines. Uh, he became Governor General of the Philippines when that was a meaningful position that sometimes was a presidential feeder. Secretary of State under Hoover. And, and, then, uh, and then Secretary Warren to Roosevelt. Just a remarkable career, excellence throughout. Um, contrast that, though, with Marshall. I'm not going to go every one, over every one of these little stops, but when you're in the military, as if any of you have served in the military, uh, sometimes your assignments last no more than two or three years, and they're usually at some remote fort located, originally placed to look after the Native Americans. Uh, and he just hopped around from fort to fort to fort to fort until the war. I keep on doing that. Um, he did have a, a pretty great uh, experience in World War I. The problem with Marshall, though, was he immediately, very early on, he became not only the best student in the Army, but he also became the best teacher in the Army and certainly the best staff officer in the Army. And as any of you who've served in the corporate world or the army, you, you know that if you become pigeonholed as someone who's great at staff work, you're never, someone always wants you and you're never given command. And in the military, you never get promoted. So despite he, he, he had an impeccable service record, promotions went to people in command of men, whether it's at some fort during peace or in the army. Douglas MacArthur, for example, he started in the army a year after Marshall got promoted to general 16 years before him because he had command of troops in World War I and Marshall served under Pershing. So he was phenomenal every step of the way. He got on Roosevelt's radar because of the work during the Depression. Roosevelt gave the Army responsibility for all those uh, public works programs. 
and Marshall was better than anyone at, uh, at, at productivity uh, and morale building at these. Uh, Harry Hopkins was told that he should talk to Marshall uh, about um, preparedness and, um, and Roosevelt, and he told Roosevelt, you should make this guy chief of staff. One quick story, um, he was chief of staff, uh, he was rather as an aide to General Pershing right after the war for five years. Here's how he got to know Pershing, and it's a good story. It was World War I, we had gone over to France, but we were training, and Pershing was going around to various divisions, seeing the progress, and he gets to Marshall's division, division, first division, and um, they put on exercises for him, and then Pershing gets together with the general in charge, along with five or six others, including Marshall, and they just start to talk about the exercises. And Pershing just leans into the general in charge, said, you're a disgrace. This division's achieved nothing. How can we ever win the war if you're putting on, you know, if you're with this incompetence? And he's going hard at him. And Marshall, who is just a, an aide to that general, basically says, General Pershing, that's not fair at all. And Pershing grunts and starts to walk away. Marshall grabs his arm. This is General the Army's Pershing. And says, General Marshall, I've been here the longest. You need to listen to me. And he proceeds in the next five to ten minutes to basically very articulately tell them all the problems they're facing, how they're solving them, exactly what the situation was. Um, Marshall grunted and walked away. And the other members of that staff all gathered around Marshall and said, what are you thinking? Your, your career's over. <laughs> While Pershing was walking away, he turned to his aide and said, when we're ever speaking to the First Division, I only want to speak to Marshall. So he admired the candor, the articulate, uh, the, how articulate he was. Um, so what was so special about the partnership? This is a quote from, from Winston Churchill. I'll read it. It remains a mystery to me, as yet unexplained, how the very small staffs which the U.S. kept during the years of peace were able not only to build up the armies and air force units, but also to find the leaders and vast staffs capable of handling enormous masses and of moving them faster and farther than masses have ever been moved in war before. Churchill said this 50, uh, five years after the war. And Churchill also said that Marshall was the greatest figure that emerged from the war. Now, Hollister mentioned that I've been a banker and I've specialized in commodities. It's actually all commodities, agricultural metals and, and energy. And one of the reasons I feel I, I have a greater appreciation for Marshall and Stimson's uh, efforts getting the army prepared was because I dealt with, cl my clients moved masses of commodities from one part of the world to the other part. And in speaking to them over many years, uh, logistics was always the big problem. Transportation, storage at the origin, transportation by train or ship. You have to store it when you get there. You have to break it into smaller pieces. I, they're doing this in a far bigger, bigger way during a wartime environment, and they need to get stuff to Asia, men and material to Asia and Europe. It was a phenomenal performance, and I call it the greatest feat of management in the history of the world. And no one's yet come back and tell me it, that I'm wrong about that. And let me give you a little explanation of what they faced when they were put together. Soldiers, we had 170,000, about 19th in the world, when Marshall took over the army in September 39. Compared to Nazi Germany at that point that had six million. Officers, during peacetime, seniority rules. So you don't really get the uh, these smartest guys rising to the ranks. Barracks, we had none. There were some temporary ones built in World War I. They were all unlivable. Weapons, we had a, a rifle that was predated World War I. We had, <laughs> we had 300 planes that were fighter ready. The Nazis had 10 times that. Tanks, Nazis had 3,000. We didn't have enough, we had hardly any. When they were doing war games in Louisiana, we had to get pickup trucks and write the, paint the word tank on the side of it. We were completely unprepared. We had a dysfunctional, whoa, we had a dysfunctional uh, 
I, I, don't, I realize I don't need to <laughs> be here. <laughs> That's fine. Um, and we had dated strategic plans. So everything was pretty bad. What were the obstacles? Time. When Stimson took over in July 1940, France had fallen, Norway, Belgium, and we knew we were going to get involved in this war. Isolationism. I like to show this map to explain why the country was overwhelmingly isolationist. Your typical American, he sees on the right side about 3,000 miles to Europe, nothing but an ocean in between. On the left side, 5,500 miles to, to Japan. You had Canada, I'm sure they was as friendly in 1940 as they are today. Mexico wasn't much of a threat. We had fought World War I 23 years before. A lot of men died, we spent a lot of money. Now they're fighting again. Your typical American's like, no, I do not support solving Europe's problems again. So, fortunately you had people like Stimson, who before the war, and one of the reasons Roosevelt put him in the spot, was there were two people in the world making a lot of fuss about Hitler in the 30s. In Europe, it was Churchill. And most of the people were closing their ears because World War I devastated Europe. And they just didn't want to hear about a problem. In America, it was Stimson. He basically said, this guy's bad. Bad things are going to happen. And it's in our interest that we stop him. Now, why would he think that? He was an advisor to the top corporations in America and several of the top corporations in the world. That's one reason. He knew how interconnected trade was. And he knew if the Nazis took over one part of the world, economically, we might be ruined. He also served at, as Secretary of State, so he, had, he knew about the capabilities of various economies. So he was decidedly an interventionist. Um, other obstacles. America's always feared a powerful army. Going back to when George III insisted that all British troops be able to stay at any house in Boston. We've just never wanted a standing army. George Washington wanted one. The rest of the Constitutional Convention said no. Uh, after every war, we, have, we, we shrink our army to practically nothing. America's fear of corporate monopolies. When Stimson was building up Germany, do you think he cared if Volkswagen got too big a contract or Messerschmitt or Krupp? No, but when Marshall and Stimson were trying to get corporate America to build things and to bid, if Alcoa came in with the best product at the lowest price and the quickest delivery, the Roosevelt administration would be like, well, hold on, you know, that's going to create a monopoly. We need to spread that work out. We're fighting a war. It drove them crazy. They, they, and Stimson was a huge antitrust person. But during a war, he said, we have to put that aside if we want to compete. And there's a general complacency. There's a myth in America that going back to the revolution that we just, that farmers would take their muskets off the wall and America would be ready to fight. And the reason it was a myth in the revolution is it was the French Navy that really won the war for us along with several professional soldiers. Marshall in speeches before the war would say, in the revolution, we had 10 times as many troops as the British. During the War of 1812, we had 30 times as many troops as the British. And he said, and we barely won those wars with those huge man advantages. And he said, it's because we weren't prepared and we weren't trained. Um, so America's always had this complacency. So these two guys get together in July 40. They had two offices together where the door was always kept open between them. And they met four or five times a day, either in one office or the other or unless this was staged, and it probably was, maybe sometimes in between. Now, why did they leave the door open? For two reasons. One, they're practical men. And if they're going to see each other four or five times a day, why not leave the door open? But more importantly, they were sending a message to their respective staffs that there are no secrets between the military and civilian authorities. And I think that uh, their staffs worked so well together that no one knew who the real boss was. They both thought they had two bosses in Stimson and Marshall when that really wasn't the case. The, you know, the army guys reported to Marshall and the civilians reported to Stimson. So they had to tackle each shortage simultaneously. Soldiers, I mentioned a few minutes ago they had 170,000. Within 18 months, they had two and a half million. That's logistically not that easy. Barracks, 
They built enough barracks in 18 months to house 1.2 million in 200 different, 250 different locations. That's like, I grew up in Rowayton. It's about a town of 5,000. It's like building 250 Rowaytons in 18 months. These guys supervised that. Ammunition. They needed everything. And I'm going to give you an example that I love to use. I mentioned the Springfield rifle that they had. They needed a new rifle. And it, you can't just go to Amazon Prime, type in high-powered rifle, sort by ratings or price, and then you know, click that little arrow instead of one or two, you, you store three million of them. These guys had to, had to design one and build one from scratch. Stimson and Marshall presided over that. What goes into a rifle? Durability. You want the thing to last the war. Precision. There's a guy coming out of the woods charging at you. <laughs> you want it to be precise. Weight. Most of the time, if not all the time, you're not shooting a rifle. You're just carrying it on your back. You want it to be light. Cost. That's obvious. Ease to manufacture. Also obvious. Rate of fire. That same guy's coming out of the woods, and if you miss that first shot, you want to get off a second one pretty quickly. Ease of use. You can't have 10 pages of instructions on how to use. Consistency. How you shoot the first time is how you want it to shoot the last time. All these things had to be factored in. Now, Marshall's men, they wanted the perfect rifle. You understand they're trying to protect their troops. And if we had 10 years and a couple billion dollars, I'm sure they could have come up with a perfect rifle. Stimson's men, on the other hand, the civilians, they were like, well, wait, you know, we need this right away. So you had to come, you had to wait these certain characteristics. And Marshall and Stimson were responsible for this. And along with every other weapon, from standard issue boots to, to tanks and planes. So uh, planes uh, and, and tanks, all, all, all these things, these guys were responsible for not just designing, procuring, but also transporting around the world. I want to talk a little, they couldn't do this themselves. I want to talk a little about their staff. I love this slide because I always think, imagine me giving this presentation to an elementary school and, and asking the kids, do you notice any pattern here? Uh, Stimson was an elitist, but it's not what you think. If you guys, if I just stopped here, you guys would think, yeah, if you didn't go to Harvard, you weren't getting on Stimson's staff. That's not the case. But it, let me explain why it, he was justified in doing this. Um, Simpson went to Yale and Harvard, by the way, as I mentioned. So his preference was he, he did think that the Yale undergraduate and the Harvard graduate degree were the best ways to, to enter public service. But these guys were not only exceptional at, at, uh, at Harvard. Uh, the guy on the left, uh, Robert Patterson, was number two in his class. This guy, Bundy, was number one in his class. This guy clerked for Oliver Wendell Holmes. I can't imagine. He had to be in the top five. But their careers were, were he was one of the best lawyers till he became one of the best judges in the country. McCloy was one of the great lawyer, New York lawyers and considered the great negotiator of his age. Lovett was a banker. He went to Harvard Law, became a banker, founded along with Harriman, Brown Brothers Harriman, considered the best banker of his age. He was on the Federal Reserve. Bundy was the best lawyer in New England. He, why did he need this, this type of staff? Because these guys had to negotiate contracts and, and, and with all the big companies to try to build weapons. And he, they had to solve problems. They had to work as a team. All things that the law did a good job. When you're working on a big law case, you, you, you need to manage teams. It, it was a perfect combination. This staff was considered the best in Washington, D.C. And I argue, and again, no one's disputed me, that it's the best staff that any cabinet officers ever had. Um, that was his recruiting style. Now, Marshall's was a bit different. And by the way, this um, little black book, that was little, my little touch. I just wanted to show off my technical skills. Uh, it, the portrait, he didn't have it in his lap during the portrait. I just <laughs> used Photoshop to get it over. But he was a remarkable guy in that from when he first started in the Army, he did keep a little black book. And he no noted any time he ran into someone impressive, he made a notation. Who the person was, what impressed them, what impressed him, and how he could use him in the future. So, Eisenhower in the upper left. In 1919, Marshall met him. 
and they were discussing purging memoirs. Eisenhower had an idea. Marshall didn't like the idea. But instead of just walking away saying, okay, sir, Eisenhower basically stayed in the room and debated and tried to win the argument in a very articulate way. Marshall made a notation in his black book that he thought Eisenhower was very smart, confident, etc. Patton. Patton, he noted in his book too. I'm sure he didn't write this, but it was kind of like this. He said, he's a bit crazy, but he would make a great tank commander as long as you can rein him in. And sure enough, that's how he used him later on. So this is how Marshall recruited people. When it, and, you know, during peacetime, most soldiers, during peace, they're, they're playing sports, they're drinking, they're, they're chasing the wives of other officers, they're doing anything but preparing for war. Marshall was different. He was always studying war plans, making notes in his black book, under the assumption that someday he may lead the army and there may be a war. Both those things had to happen. The odds of that happening during his tenure were slim, but he felt it was, he was his duty to do so. So when he was put in charge, he just opened the black book and just started placing people. And he was almost impeccable in his choices. Remarkable. He didn't have MacArthur in his black book. I only put this uh, up because um, it shows another facet of Marshall's uh, personality. Um, MacArthur didn't like anyone who served under John Pershing during the war in the staff position because MacArthur was a bit paranoid and felt that they were always trying to slow him down from gaining glory. So he had it out for Marshall. When he was chief of staff in the 1930s, he prevented Marshall from getting promoted, even though Roosevelt wanted promoted to general. Uh, he also sent him to some remote teaching assignment from a very good assignment. So he was retired in 1939, but with war approaching, Marshall said, I can't ignore his greatness. <laughs> he's a leader of men, and he's a very uh, great st uh, strategic thinker. So he hired him, and he didn't, never regretted it. Marshall, uh, MacArthur didn't let him down. Um, so what I've talked about so far, and I do want to keep track of time, is, is the pre-war. Now, Pearl Harbor hits, everything changes. One, isolationism disappears overnight. So that's good, but they still need to, that's just impediments. Now everyone's on board. Interesting anecdote, and it was so fun reading Simpson's diary. On December 7th, 1941, his entry in the diary, he was almost giddy and excited. He's like, at last, you know. We're at war. This is going to be great. We are going to win this thing hands down. Marshall, on the other hand, was devastated. His wife, in her memoirs, wrote that he came home, hardly looked at her, and just said, I'm going to bed, walked upstairs. He was devastated. Now, why is that the case? I mentioned before, Stimson, because of his background as a huge advisor to corporate America and as a, 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 a public servant, he knew that with isolationism gone, America would outproduce every other nation on both sides of the war combined, which is what happened. Marshall had no way of knowing that. And maybe Stimson told him, but he couldn't trust Stimson. So that was the difference in their, uh, in their attitudes on Pearl Harbor Day. Um, these are some of the issues they faced. Uh, I think the question and answer period is so interesting that I'm not going to go over these in details. Um, but they had to determine all the things that are coming out of America's factories that they're responsible for, except ships, of course. Um, that would be the Navy. They had to decide who gets it, the US, the United Kingdom, the Soviet Union, that was on our side, or, or China, that was also on our side. Uh, they had to decide, we're at war with the Japanese and the Germans. Who do we fight first? These are the decisions these two guys made, along with Roosevelt, of course. Uh, they decided on Europe and put Japan on hold. Uh, but then you have to do the strategy there, D-Day, or, or do you do what the British want, which is just do everything but go into France. Uh, the Pacific, all kinds of strategies there. The Fi Philippines, save it or, aban uh, or, or abandon it. Uh, we decided to try to save it, and of course we failed. Uh, Japanese Americans, what to do with them? The whole West Coast, every politician, every person wants them interned. Uh, Stimson made that decision to do so. I devote a whole chapter to it. It was the wrong decision. I'd tell you, but 
then you'd have no reason to buy the book. So, <laughs> uh, The atomic bomb, people don't realize Henry Stimson was responsible for building the atomic bomb. I mean, along with his, all, all his other responsibilities. <laughs> he had to you know, take care of that as well. Post-war Germany, they had to plan for the post-war. Stimson, the Marshall Plan after the war really should be called the Stimson Marshall Plan because Marshall used all Stimson's ideas about how to treat Germany after the war in his post-war recovery. Um, how to end the war in Japan. Do we invade? Do we drop a bomb? Do we give the Japanese something to hold on to to allow them to save face? All these decisions that these guys faced during the war. And they had to deal with other people. They couldn't just do it themselves. Obviously, Roosevelt on top, they had to deal with Stalin, De Gaulle, the press, uh, various agencies uh, uh, built up by Roosevelt to help these two guys. Sometimes they were a hindrance. MacArthur, I mentioned, you're constantly. War in a democracy is hard. You have to deal with Congress all the time. Uh, Admiral King. King wanted all the resources uh, for the Pacific and the Navy. Uh, you had big business and labor, each that wanted to take advantage of the enormous spending that was going on, and you have the British. As I mentioned, the big issue, and it's a theme throughout the book, the British never wanted to do D-Day, even up to the night of the eve of D-Day. They just felt that you could beat Germany by bombing them or maybe uh, blockading them, and Marshall and Stimson both thought, no, you need boots on the ground, you need to go into France and then into Germany, or they won't surrender. They ended up being correct. Hitler didn't surrender until people were over his bunker, and he even then didn't surrender. He shot himself, but I think Marshall was correct. Marshall may have been, Stimson may have been wrong. They wanted to go a year earlier. British might have been right, right there. I go into it fairly deeply. So I'm going to spend the last few minutes talking about a couple shared characteristics between these guys. Uh, they were remarkably similar in certain ways. Um, preparation, I mentioned Marshall. Stimson as a, was considered the nation's top lawyer. Time magazine called him that in the 40s. He was apparently the most prepared lawyer that ever uh, went to trial uh, during that era. Common sense, simple and concise. Marshall taught uh, for about five years at a critical time because 150 generals during the war all went through Marshall's training class. And it used to be when he had this class, they would, uh, the students would do, uh, who were high-ranking officers, would do presentations, some military presentation, like the Napoleonic Wars or something. And those presentations were typically an hour. And Marshall said, we're going to keep that to 15 minutes. And all the officers complained. He said, you can't talk about it in 15 minutes. Marshall stood up and gave a complete history of the Civil War in less than five minutes and shut everyone up. <laughs> uh, he was remarkably... Uh, efficient with words. They were both candid. It's not easy being, sorry, it's not easy being uh, candid in any relationship. And these guys felt the good of the war. They had to, and I know this from Simpson's diary, they had to sit down sometimes and have real heart-to-heart -heart conversations. They had disagreements, but they knew, despite the fact that it can be awkward, they had to do it, and they did. And they demanded candid conversations with everyone. Issue-oriented. Stimson was known as the most bipartisan politician of that era. He was, after all, Republican, serving in the Roosevelt administration. He just only believed the issues counted, and all his life he was that way. They delegated but demanded accountability. They were both decisive. Here's another funny anecdote. Um, uh, two anecdotes, one Marshall, one Stimson. Marshall's in a meeting, and he's interrupted by one of his staff and said, General, I need to talk to you. There's a guy here who's talking about this utility vehicle. He thinks it would be great for, for, for the Army, both in Asia and Europe. And Marshall turns to him and says, do you think it's a good idea? And he said, yeah. He said, then go do it. And that turned to be the guy he was talking to invented the Jeep. And we ordered 650,000 during World War II. Marshall made the decision like that. Stimson, I'm reading his diary one day. I can't remember when early in the war, and he writes four or five pages of all these crazy important things that are going on, and then he says, the last sentence says, oh, and another thing, I approve today the building of uh, the Pentagon. I think it's going to be a good thing, period. <laughs> now, the Pentagon is still the world's largest building that's ever been built. He just devoted a 
tiny little one sentence to it because there were more important things going on. So he was very decisive as well. Uh, protective of mind and body. These two were so far ahead of their time. They weren't these, like you read about these Wall Street kings of the universe that, you know, get three hours of sleep a night. These guys believed in three things, exercise, sleep, and rest. And they were maniacal about it. Marshall rode a horse every morning. Simpson played tennis every night. Uh, they went to bed early. They didn't believe in making decisions after 3 p.m. They thought their machines were body, were, they thought their bodies were machines, and they took care of them. And it was, they were a bit ahead of their time. Uh, detailed, but with an aim towards solving big problems. Creative, tough, but cheerful and optimistic. Now, I want to talk about them together, because that is, after all, the point of the book. It's called The Partnership. First of all, both men were known for integrity in their respective pro professions. Um, I mean, that doesn't, even, that doesn't even explain it. That At the highest level of integrity, Marshall was known. The British fought him for four years. They couldn't stand them. But to a man, they all said after the war, he was the most honest guy we've ever faced. So, uh, and Stimson was known that in the law and public service. Teamwork, I've mentioned that. Transparency, the open door. They were completely transparent. Duty, I think I've mentioned that. Stimson served as a 50-year-old, 50-year-old in World War I. And he used his connections to get there. But that's okay. If you, use your, if you use your connections to get out of a war or to get into a safe job, that's not okay. But he used his connections to be an artillery man, <laughs> which means bombs were going to be falling on him. Uh, he felt it was his duty. He wasn't seeking glory. He wasn't a glorious seeker. Uh, loyalty, they were incredibly loyal to each other. The benefit of the diary is showing how many times Marshall had to lift Stimson up or the other way around. Humility, two stories, and then I'm going to take questions. Um, Marshall, after Germany was defeated, he wanted to retire. He sent a note to Truman saying, I want to retire. <laughs> Uh, put eyes and arrow in my place. And he had all these plans with his wife. Um, this, this gets to duty as well. So he does retire, maybe four months after the war, because Truman kept him on. Because he's a modest man, simple ceremony, he drives 40 miles to their home in Virginia. He and his wife get on their porch. They are so psyched that they now have a life where they can do all the things they wanted to do that they haven't been able to do. His wife says, I'm going to take a nap. She goes upstairs. Simpson goes downstairs, stays downstairs, rather, and the phone rings. And this is the day he retired. It's Truman. It's like, General. It's like, Mr. President. It's like, I want you to go to China. And Marshall didn't want to wake up his wife, so he said, OK, <laughs> and hung up. His wife comes down about an hour and a half later. And it's at the turn of the hour, 4 o'clock or 5 o'clock or something. Marshall's on the couch, and the news is on. She's halfway down the stairs, and she hears on the news. And in other news today, President Truman named Marshall to head a delegation. He's leaving for China tomorrow. And his, his wife's like, how long have I been asleep? And he served another six or seven years. Secretary, he did that mission, then Secretary of State, then Secretary of War again, or rather they renamed it Secretary of Defense during the Korean War. So duty driven, but his last assignment was the coronation of Queen Elizabeth II, I think 1953 maybe, and he was representing the U.S. there. And if any of you have been to Westminster Abbey, you can picture it. He's walking in with Omar Bradley, General Omar Bradley, and as he's walking down the aisles towards a very prominent seat, row after row on both sides were standing and applauding him. And, and these weren't just any people. These are people who were invited to Queen Elizabeth II's coronation, heads of state, royal families from all over Europe, the most prominent people in the world. And Marshall turns to Omar Bradley and says, who, who are they clapping for? <laughs> and Bradley turns to him, and he's known him all his life, and just says, you, you, you moron. You know, I don't think he said that exactly, but that's how humble George Marshall was. People, I mean, he was the most respected guy on earth at that time, practically. Civilian over military. So this is just my own opinion that I think one of the things that truly make America great is we have always believed that 
The military has to be subordinate to the civilians. And this is a photograph from Stimson's last day in office, which was his 78th birthday. Now, back in the 40s, the age 78 was much older than it is today, <laughs> you know? Uh, so he, he had this long career. He had a heart attack the last week of the war. Um, so it's his last day of office. Stimson kept him on until September 28th or something like that. And, um, but he had a meeting. He was going to address the cabinet because he had this idea that the atomic secret should be shared with the world. Not a popular idea. Uh, and he wanted to pitch it to the cabinet. So he had to prepare during the day. And then he went to the meeting. The cabinet meeting was delayed. Marshall decided that he needed a good send-off. So without letting Stimson know while he was gone, he gathered 125 generals, the biggest gathering of US generals in the history of the country, along with Stimson's staff, an army band, to the tarmac where, planes, where Stimson's plane was. And because of the delay, the, these guys had to stand in the hot sun. And actually, there's an app where you can look up historical weather. So I confirmed, as a good historian would, that it was a hot day. Uh, two by two in a line, basically waiting for more than an hour for him. Stimson finally gets to the airport with his wife on the left. And he walks down this line, greeting one general after the other, with two applause, presumably. And at the end, right before the steps to the plane, is Marshall who takes off his hat, bows his head, and escorts Stimson up the stairs. It's a very emotional moment for both. Now, I love this picture, I love this story, and here's why. Marshall was fond of Stimson. He hung his portrait for when he's Secretary of State and Secretary of War right above his desk always. But again, Marshall was always teaching. You recall me saying he was the best teacher in the Army. And he was sending a message to all the generals saying, listen guys, the reputation of the US Army and Air Force will never be higher than it is today. But he wanted them to know, we serve under the civilians. This is the guy we report to. And I thought it was just, just I, I mean, obviously I'm a little biased, I wrote a book on, but I think Marshall was one of the greatest patriots that ever lived, and Stimson was someone that he thought uh, was the, one of the greatest men he ever knew. My last comment is that Dwight Eisenhower, Late in life, was asked by his biographer, who's the greatest American he ever met? And Eisenhower, who's little, he met a lot of great men in his life. He said, he immediately said, Marshall. And then he paused and said, with Stimson a close second. I'll take questions. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I know you like to be concise, and I don't want to take too much time, but how would you frame Marshall's inability uh, with Sinsom after the war to deal with Chiang Kai-shek and the nationalists against the communist Mao? What, it must have been very frustrating for Marshall, and you would think he would have made more progress. Uh, I haven't been asked that question yet. Uh, it's a great question. Uh, I'm going to quickly... Um, say that um, my book ends in 45, so I didn't do a lot of <laughs> research on that. <laughs> but in the epilogue to the book, epilogue's the thing at the end, right? Yes. I do write, and, I, and, and I, I say this. Think about 1860, and if some reputable guy from Britain tried to come over to the US and try to make peace between the North and South, no chance. I mean, there's no chance. We were so divided at that point. Chiang Kai-shek and Mao Zedong, and I mean, they were all, uh, my belief without looking into it, were just as divided. It was an impossible mission. He knew it was an impossible mission. Truman sent him kind of like a Hail Mary type of thing. So I think he had, had it up against him. If he couldn't do it, no one could. And, you know, yeah. But it's a great question. Thanks for your very eloquent presentation. Appreciate that, thank you. Do, you. do you have some thoughts about the country today and in that context, are we ever gonna see another greater or great generation of, of leaders? Uh, 
I have a bias, and my, my bias is simply that I don't see the same quality of leadership in our nation today that I saw uh, with the number of people that you had on the slides that you showed. I'm not in the habit of saying another great question, but that's another great question. I can't remember the historian who said that he was trying to get his grips around why, how it could be that Virginia in the late 1700s produced Jefferson, Washington, Madison, Monroe, John Marshall, Patrick Henry, and the list goes on. So many amazing men. And he said the population of Virginia at that time was the same as Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania today. Do you think we could pull that kind of talent out of Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania? I think that maybe I'm more optimistic than you. I think if a crisis came, even with a messed up democracy like ours, and all democracies are messed up, and Churchill famously said it's the best form of government after every other, you know, or rather, what did he say? He said democracy's the worst, yeah, government, with the exception of all the others. So I like to think that if a crisis comes up, Perhaps you can get men like that, but uh, I'm certainly not going to put my money down on it. Hope that answers the Hi. Um, you've, uh, so I'm looking really for your uh, opinion rather than expertise because it's about current events. Um, you talked a lot about logistics, both um, American and indeed uh, the German uh, logistics uh, effort was very successful. Um, how would you compare and contrast that with the Russians going into Ukraine and why their logistics has been so appalling. I just wonder if you had a view on that. Maybe they're facing a few of the same things that we faced, a, a complacency. Maybe the Soviet system doesn't uh, reward talent. Maybe getting to the top of the Soviet army is more a political thing uh, versus a meritocracy. My guess is that's kind of it. I don't think the Soviet system raises the top brass to the top. I think if you, are, if you show blind loyalty, you're going to get a promotion. And when it comes in, every country has this issue. And we've had it during our history as well. Sometimes you get to the top for the wrong reasons. And, and these guys were very quick to dismiss people who might have gotten into those positions for that reason. So my guess is that it's kind of a broken system where you just don't have top guys making it to the, to the top. Yes. Uh, thank you for your uh, presentation. Uh, you made reference to uh, General MacArthur during your presentation. Uh, he had a reputation of being kind of a super egotist and not likely to follow other people's instructions or uh, directions. Can you comment on the relationship between General Marshall, George Marshall, and uh, MacArthur during the Second World War? Sure. Um... So the, it, it, to, to talk about the relations during the war, I kind of have to mention their history, and their history was that Martha, oh, MacArthur always viewed Marshall suspiciously because he was part of the Chaumont crowd. Chaumont was a town in France where Pershing and his staff were located. And it had something to do with, during the war, MacArthur had some success, and then he wanted to combine his, his group with another, and he felt, because he was a giant egotist and thought he should be running World War I <laughs> when he was a young man, uh, it, he always had it out for anyone associated with Pershing. So that's the history. Uh, Marshall thought MacArthur was great. He knew, they all knew he was an egotist, but he was a bit of a military genius, and he had tremendous leadership abilities. His, his, the men revered them. So during the war, Marshall was very patient with him. Uh, and he had to be. Marshall spent a lot of the war breaking up fights that MacArthur started with the Navy. And Mac uh, Marshall had to occasionally go against his better judgment to compromise on strategy. So when the war started, MacArthur had this idea to go into this part of the Pacific, and the Navy had another idea to go to Guadalcanal. So Marshall just basically said, all right, here's what we're going to do. The Navy's going to start. We're going to go to Qualtech Canal. Once that's done, we will do MacArthur's strategy. So it was a lot of compromise to keep him interested. But sometimes he had to be tough on him because MacArthur at one point said, all resources should go to Asia. And that just <laughs> didn't make sense. And Marshall said, you know, we're fighting two wars here. And our strategy is to fight Europe first. And so 
it was contentious, and that's one of the reasons Roosevelt, I opened the story about why he didn't name him to command D-Day, because Roosevelt knew that no one could deal with MacArthur better than Marshall. And Marshall, by the way, was the only general that Winston Churchill feared. And not because he feared him because he was a beast. It's because integrity, and then the theme for the book, is a powerful weapon. It can be a powerful weapon, whether it's in the army or in corporate America. And these two used it both perfectly. Uh, there's so many stories of, of politicians coming into Marshall, staying, complaining about this. And Marshall says, I get your point. Why don't you go talk to Secretary Stimson about it? And the congressman, of course, wouldn't because they knew he had he, this unblemished reputation as the man of highest integrity. And what they were talking about was typically a little petty. So, yeah. I hope that answers your question. For, for a, uh, as you, historian, I think you picked a marvelous subject. Thank Superb. you. Thank you. And uh, I, want to, I want to hear more. I'm going to get your book, and I encourage others. Uh, uh, Ted will be signing the books, which are for sale in the back. And yeah. So thank you for a splendid thank presentation. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Great audience. Um, I, I, can I end on one story? Please do. So Stimson looks a little like a bookkeeper when you see his picture. But, and to give the, uh, uh, again, I, I can't emphasize enough how long his career. He was a friend of Teddy Roosevelt's. Teddy Roosevelt named to his first public service job in 1906. And about that time, it was January, pre-global warming, when Washington was cold enough where ponds and rivers could freeze. And he sees President Roosevelt on a horse with the Secretary of State, a guy named Elihu Root, across Rock Creek Park, uh, the Rock Creek. And Simpson's on a horse. And Roosevelt, just as a joke, says, um, you know, come over here. I want to see you, you know. And Simpson hesitated. And then Root says, your commander in chief just ordered you to get over here, get over here. They were just kidding with him. But Simpson, because he was, uh, he was like Roosevelt, believed in you know, he would climb mountains and hunt bear. I mean, he believed in the strenuous life that, that something Teddy Roosevelt branded back then. So Roosevelt jumps in the river with his horse, icy water, submerged. The current takes him down. He's underwater again, icy water. He gets, he couldn't make it across, but they, he, he climbs up the bank and then he realizes there's a bridge like 50 yards down. <laughs> he, he goes down the bridge. His pants now are frozen because it's like 20 degrees out comes up to Roosevelt and says, reporting for duty. And Roosevelt says, what the hell are you doing? He's like, hey, you're my, my commander in chief. I'm just, I'm just following your duty. It gives you a sense that he was, more, he was a remarkable guy. When I first approached publishers, the top ones who rejected me, they said, you, you, just, there's, you need to get to the war right away. But I said, no, their backgrounds are so important to understand of how they work together. And in researching his background, he was a remarkable guy in every way. So I talked about Marshall a lot today, but Stimson, it was a true partnership. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.